Hello and welcome to today's episode. Today I am here with Hannah Lee and we're going to be talking about creating autonomy and safety in yoga and psychotherapy. Really, really excited to talk about this topic today. I think it's very important, um, not just in the yoga world, but everywhere. You are listening to Creating Wellness from Within a podcast devoted to helping you live your best life through self-care and wellness. In this podcast, we strive to offer you actionable advice and tools to help you on your journey toward greater personal wellness. I am your host, Amy Zalmer, and I am editor-in-chief of Midwest Yoga and Life magazine and author of the Chair Yoga Pocket Guide. I am passionate about all things yoga, photography, wellness, travel, and all things glittery. You can learn more about me at creatingwellnessfromwithin.com. Today, my guest is Hannah Lee, and she is a therapist and yoga instructor at Room to Breathe Psychotherapy and Yoga in Chicago, Illinois. As a social worker by training, Hannah worked on social issues such as housing, incarceration, and access to higher education before joining Room to Breathe. There, she provides individuals and group therapy, focusing primarily on trauma healing, perinatal and mental health, parenting and caregiving, and identity exploration for people of color and neurodiversity. She's a graduate of Room to Breathe's psychologically sensitive yoga teacher training and teaches a weekly online class. Welcome to the podcast, Hannah. So happy to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm really excited to dive in to this topic today. And, you know, just autonomy and safety um, are just so important. Like I said, not just in yoga, but just like everywhere we encounter other humans, right? Um, And there's just so much going on in the world today. They're trying to take away our autonomy. Um, So I think it's important to understand how to retain our own autonomy and to offer that to others around us that we interact with as well. So Hannah, where would you like to start it? Maybe, maybe let's just like define autonomy and what that means in the context of what we're talking about today. Yeah, that's a great question. And I was nodding along, even though I know no one will be able to see it later. Um, <laughs> you were sharing and Yeah, I think that autonomy being closely linked to choice, but also Mm -hmm. recognizing where choice is limited or, you know, that we can say in a yoga class or in any other kind of setting, oh, do what you want. But we have to recognize that that's not always possible for any number of reasons, resources, physical ability, sense of safety. And so I think building autonomy really means also creating the conditions that people can make the choices that they want to make for themselves. And that that certainly applies off the mat um, Mm -hmm. and is what we are trying to cultivate. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the best examples in the yoga class is um, giving people the choice if they want an adjustment, a hands-on adjustment from a teacher. And you know, even just like a few years ago, it was so commonplace for the teacher to just go around and adjust folks and put their hands on them. Um, And then we started having these discussions about autonomy and safety, and not everybody feels safe having someone put their hands on them. Um, And not every teacher is properly educated on Mm -hmm. how to safely adjust someone. And, you know, I've heard of injuries occurring, right? And so we need to be very mindful that, you know, just because you think their shoulder should come back to here doesn't mean they physically have that mobility. And you don't know that unless you've talked to them ahead of time. Um, and so giving people that choice, if, in you know, I see a big trend, we're going more and more away from hands-on adjustments for mm-hmm. that reason, I think. Um, but giving people that choice if they even want it, because not everybody wants to have someone put their hand on them. 
Absolutely. And I think that in many ways, the shift to online yoga during the pandemic created an Mm -hmm. opportunity for us to say like, okay, well, what's the value of a hands-on assist? Are we doing it, you know, well-intentioned or perhaps from a performative place or what we even Mm. think we know about what a body should do, but how that might not be actually informed to that body in that day. Um, And that there's more space we can make there. And that the option of, you know, do what you want in a class is not as empowering as here are other options to get the same sensation. You know, we're all going to be in this kind of intense pose and you can do something else is not as inviting as here's a range of options that you can build off of to elicit the same experience in your body. And I think that's a big difference as well. Yeah. Like, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've heard a teacher say, you know, or you can just stay in child's pose and, you know, child's pose isn't necessarily comfortable for everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, some body types that's, it's just not comfortable. Um, So one, right. Like just, it's not even a comfortable pose for some folks, but two, like, what if I have to stay in child's pose the whole time? Cause you were not giving me any other options on how mm-hmm. to do a pose. Um, and you know, the, the buzzword right now is all levels or accessible or, you know, appropriate for all levels. And it's okay to not be in all levels class. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. I would much rather you are up front and say, Oh, yep. This is a more advanced class or whatever term you want to use um, and have specific beginner classes because I can't tell you how many people I meet that are turned off from yoga because of that first class. They're told that it's all levels. They walk in, can't do 90% of it because they've never done yoga before. And they feel like that's how all classes are. And so they never come back to it. Mm -hmm. And it's such a disservice. Yeah, I think that you're so right that we can't just stick a label on a class and then assume that people are going to rise to that expectation. Even if we're, you know, being inviting, we have to actually pair actions with it. And I think that we see this a lot in terms of, you know, offering trauma informed classes and folks say, Mm -hmm. well, you know, I haven't experienced capital T trauma. Why? would I need that kind of yoga? But I think that we're so used to having choice taken away from us or to feel maybe uncomfortable or unfamiliar in a space that we don't always realize, oh, I don't have to feel that way the first time I try something new, that it could be inviting and I could learn something without, you know, darting around my eyes and trying to figure out what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, what, what are some tools or tips do you have for any teachers listening um, that aren't quite sure how to offer um, an inviting environment? You know, like I said, like, there are so many folks just putting that all levels label on things that aren't truly for all levels, like Mm -hmm. that brand new beginner coming in the door um, might just be completely overwhelmed and lost. And especially if you don't take the time to offer modification, I hate to use the word modifications, but like, you know, other ways to do a pose, Mm -hmm. um, you know, offering different options. Yeah. I mean, I think even that, like you said, speaks to it, that there's variations to elicit the same experience Mm -hmm. in a body. And that it's not a hierarchy, that this version Mm -hmm. is not better than um, a version that has a knee down or that you're lying down. Um, I think also to the point about levels, I think one orientation for teachers is to recognize accommodating to many different stages of life. Um, You know, I really found accessible yoga important to me when I was pregnant because 
there were plenty of classes that I went to that did not feel like I was allowed to be there or accessible, even if I had been previously. Um, somebody that's working through an injury, somebody that is mm-hmm. older, um, working through a health condition. And so, you know, that someone could be at a quote unquote advanced level, but that day, week, season of their life, yeah, something else is needed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you're so right. You know, we're all every day, our bodies are different, right? Mm-hmm. Depending on what we did or ate the day before or a week before even, or, you know, maybe you were, um, maybe you tripped and fell and just kind of jostled your body a few days ago. And so things just aren't working quite the same as they normally do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so even though, like you said, you might be a more advanced practitioner in that day you you aren't um and so having someone showing you variations um and like you said you know it it's not about achieving the perfect pose that is not at all what yoga is about and that message seems to have gotten lost Mm -hmm. and it's about doing the best you can do in any given day and just energetically trying your hardest, you know, to, you know, if you can't get your arms behind your back, like not everybody can do that. And I, I can grasp my hands, but that is about as much as I can do. I can't grasp my elbows. Mm -hmm. Um, but just getting your hands behind you. And if you can't get them all the way behind you, right. Like maybe using a strap to hold on to each side. Like there's so many ways we can like achieve the same feeling in our body even though we can't grasp our elbows behind our back. Yeah. And if you are flexible and have never not been able to grab your elbows behind your back, you can't understand what it's like to not be able to do that. I, I, did I make sense in how I said that? Yeah. You're nodding. Um, so like if you've never in your own body experienced it, it's so much harder to understand where, you know, I've had a brain injury. I've had my whole body shut down on me. So I understand what it's like to not be able to do things. Um, I can't do inversions, um, you know, and like, but if you've never experienced that, you just can't comprehend, um, you know, like people always want me to try and do a headstand and I'm like, nope, never going to happen. I can't do inversions. And until I explain that to them, they can't comprehend why I wouldn't want to try to do one or even a shoulder stand. And I'm like, no, I can't. I physically can't. And so you don't know the story of the people coming into your class for that first time. Yeah. Um, And just holding space for everyone and giving them all autonomy and safety, you know, it's not just about like physical safety. It's about feeling safe. Yeah. Um, So why don't you talk a little more about that aspect of it, Hannah? Yeah. I think that one way that shows up both in a class with us and also a therapy session is telling someone where the practice or the session is going. And that Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you're Mm -hmm saying and we have to hit these points but that like this is my outline this is my my map and there'll be options and choices throughout but you know our brains are working really hard to figure out okay well when are they going to ask me about this thing or when are we going to be standing versus coming to the ground and there's a sense of mental load that we don't have to carry if we feel like oh I know generally where we're going and I also know along the way there's choices um rather than this person's in charge I don't know where they're going they're leading me into a forest and hope I come out the other side um but bringing that curiosity about somebody's experience allowing them to bring their identity um creates more room for let's co-create this practice or this session. And, you know, this is where I'm going mentally, but where do you want to go in your body and your emotional experience today? Mm -hmm. And even just like, how many times does your teacher put you in a pose and then left you there? And you're like, 
how much longer? Whereas if you know going into it, oh, we're going to hold this for 15 counts, right? Like that makes it so much more attainable in your mind. Like you, there's there's no question, like, are we going to be here for 20 minutes, <laughs> right? Like, oh, okay, this 15 counts. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I can do anything for 15 counts. Right. Um, but or if I, I don't know exactly, or I can come out of it. Um, and, you know, and I think also just what you just said, like telling them, you know, if this gets to be too intense, come out of it at any point and just giving them that permission, because I've been in so many yoga classes in my life where you get some dirty looks if you come out of a pose or if you don't do what the teacher's telling you to do. Um, and it's, it's my, it's my practice, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I have always been the type, I'm going to do what I want to do. Um, way before anybody told me I could do what I want to do in a yoga class. <laughs> and so I'm sure I annoyed some of my teachers. Um, you know, I used to go like to the, the gym, um, to take yoga classes. And I mean, there was, it was literally just the teacher up there. It it was more like being in an aerobics class Mm -hmm. than, um, it, then it felt like an actual yoga class. Right. Well, I think it points to, you know, what's the purpose of the practice and people can have different answers to that. Um, you know, if the purpose is to have everyone in the class, look the same in their bodies at the exact same moment. Well, first of all, you're going to be working really hard as the teacher because that's not going to happen. Everyone's bodies are different, but then also it loses out on somebody building their awareness of their internal experience and their interoception, which I think that like it's first and foremost in so much of the work that we do of the purpose here is for you to build awareness of what this feels like in your body, in your emotional experience, and then decide what you want to do with that. Um, And when that's the case, the options to get there suddenly broaden. Um, And you as the teacher have less pressure in many ways uh, because you're not trying to get everybody's body to do the same thing at the same time. Mm -hmm. And let's talk a little more about interoception because I think that's that's sort of the key to yoga, right? Um, And essentially, you know, it sort of means like having body awareness, but being Mm -hmm. able to go inside and and listen to your body. And I was actually surprised to learn that not everybody has this (laughs) because I am so in tune with my body. I know every little thing my body tells me. And I just thought that that was everybody. And then in my training, I learned no. Um, So I'd love for you to talk a little more about that. Yeah. Well, I think to that point, we don't live in a world that cultivates interoception and body awareness. I think about, you know, even with kids to sit this way, to go to the bathroom at these times. So even if you, you know, everyone is born with that innate, awareness that does need to then be cultivated and honored and for us to build a set of skills around accessing it and then also respecting it Um, Mm. and so it's not a surprise when it gets lost and I think especially um, you know different nervous systems work differently um, and certain brains and bodies do have a harder time accessing that awareness I think especially when you've done a lot of that you know, work through perhaps having a chronic illness or an injury, like suddenly you are also very attuned in an additional way Um, versus that might be a little bit harder for somebody um, who's autistic or an ADHD -er. Um, and again, not in a comparison way, but just in a like, how is this a skill you might build that then you can use in your day-to-day life of, oh, I don't need the watch to tell me to stand up. I can listen to my low back or my hips to say, yeah, I want to stand up now, or I do need to go to the bathroom, or, you know, I am going to roll my shoulders down away from my ears. And then where we become our, the leaders of our own bodies, um, which is very much restoring autonomy um, 
and choice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, I, I didn't realize that it, it was something that not everybody understood. Um, but, you know, your point about like, as a child in school, you're told where to sit, when to go to the bathroom, you have to ask permission for everything. And so it does, it sort of strips us of our autonomy and our interoception. Um, I never had really looked at it from that perspective before, like even all the way through college. I mean, college, you have a little more flexibility, but not full autonomy. And so um, that's really interesting how we're almost teaching ourselves not to listen to our inner, our inner selves mm-hmm. in some ways. I think from I'm sure therapy. you see that come out a lot in therapy sessions. Yeah. I mean, that was what I was going to say. And it gets kind of memed or stereotyped the therapist saying like, where do you feel that in your body? And people being like, mm-hmm. well, hell if I know. Um, and I think that is, another opportunity to be psychologically sensitive and informed as any kind of practitioner that like that's that phrase may not resonate for many people because they don't have a sense of oh when I feel anger I feel my hands clench or I feel a tightness in my throat and building that um, internal map is often a starting point for for many of us that okay, the anxiety or the anger, whatever emotion that maybe is more challenging and also the happiness, like it doesn't just drop out of the sky, but there are clues that our body gives us that that emotion's building. And also through things like movement, we have a chance to shape that emotion. You know, if we're anxious and we stay tight and closed off, how does that physical experience reinforce the emotion? Um, what does, what happens when we open up our chest and step outside for a few minutes? And, you know, not that that is by any means a solution to chronic anxiety, but I think it's linking body and emotion and mind differently. Yeah. Yeah. And I just have to imagine being a therapist and a yoga teacher, it brings a different perspective. Um, you know, I've done trauma informed teacher training. So like, I've learned quite a bit, but I just have to imagine as a therapist, it just brings a whole other dimension to to teaching yoga. Yeah, I think it's really fun. Um, <laughs> I think, it, you know, being able to see the ways in which these are modalities that can go hand in hand. But then also the ways in which they've been very um, exclusive and haven't been accessible. And yes, for all the reasons that we know kind of visually, um, who's in a class, what are they wearing, et cetera, but also in the language that we use, you know, our teacher training, for example, you know, learning the Sanskrit, learning the philosophy, but then also not just saying, do this. And then not providing context for what is that word? Um, What does it mean? Where does it come from? And, you know, I think one of the things that is exciting for me is that that's, that puts me in a position of ongoing learning, you know, that Mm. I'm not coming in saying like, well, I've figured that all out and I know all these things. And so I'm going to say this word and you're going to know what to do. So much as like, I need to continue to do my own work of where am I holding on to perhaps power or, um, exclusiveness and it's not serving anyone. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, Hannah, this is such good info. I could talk to you all day on this. Um, but we do need to uh, wrap up. And so I want to make sure we mention how people can find you and you um, work through room to breathe chicago.com is where they can find how to work with you. Um, so tell us a little bit of other ways we can find you. I'm sure you're on socials um, and just um, how to find you and how they can work with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our Instagram for the practice is room to breathe Chicago. And then my personal therapy page is underscore therapy with Hannah. 
Um, all of our classes are offered online, so you can take them wherever you are. And then for therapy, we offer telehealth. I'm licensed in Illinois and Minnesota, and between us, we all have a range, um, but primarily Illinois um, folks for therapy because of licensure. Um, mm -hmm. But telehealth is very real and part of our lives, so we are excited to yeah. connect with you, hopefully, in a yoga class. Um, we offer many workshops and therapy groups as well. Awesome. Well, Hannah, thank you so much for being here today and just taking your time to share with our listeners. Thank you for making the space. I appreciate it. No, thank you. And thank you everyone for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's episode and please consider leaving a five-star review wherever you are listening to help others on their wellness journey discover the podcast. And also be sure to head to MidwestYogaLife.com to stay in the know of all things happening in the Midwest. Have a great day, everyone, and I will see you in the next episode.